Let's grab our Bibles, our phones, somebody else's Bible, the Bible behind the pew, and let's say our Bible confession like we mean it. Because everything I believe in, our Bible confession is powerful. And if you read it, pray on it before you read your Bible, I think you'll be, you, uh, I know you will because I'm moved every time I say it. So this is my Bible. This is God speaking to me. My heart is prepared to receive all of God's promises and instructions. Today I make my Bible the final authority in my life so that in every circumstance I will bear good fruit and others will see Christ in me. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> Woo! Hallelujah. Amen. amen. Stretch your hands out to me, please. Father, I just come to you humbly to your throne, giving you thanks and praise, Father. You have me up here for a purpose and a reason, so I uh, pray that I please you, that I deliver your word accurately, efficiently, correctly. Father, and that... Uh, this word does not go out void, that it goes into your people's heart, uh, changes their life. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so let's grow here. Am I good enough? Woo, am I good enough? Is that you? Do you hear that record playing over and over? I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. Am I the only one? Am I good enough? You walk through the halls of your school saying what? I'm not good enough. You walk on a football field, soccer field, basketball court, I'm not good enough. You go to work feeling I'm not good enough. You wake up before you even get up out of the bed, you're saying I'm not good enough. You come to church feeling like you're not good enough. Is that you? What about this one? I'm not, a good, am I good, I'm not good enough to be a father. I'm not good enough to be a mother. I'm not good enough to be a parent. I'm not good enough to be a friend. I'm not good enough to be a leader. I'm not good enough to be a pastor. I'm not good enough to serve. What about this one? I'm not a good enough husband. I'm not a good enough wife. I'm not a good enough friend. I'm not a good enough person. I'm not good enough for God. Is that you today? Are you feeling like that today? that you're not good enough. Well, let me tell you something, church. You're good enough is not good enough. Let me say it again. You're good enough is not good enough, but God is good enough, and God is God enough. He is adequate. He's sufficient, and his grace endures forever, and is good enough for us. Amen? So we don't have to feel like we're not good enough for God or anyone else. I'm not good enough. So this message that I have for you today, God placed on my heart. So I pray and trust, or my hope, my prayers, when you leave here today, that you're going you, to feel empowered because you're going to know who you are in Christ. And you're going to realize that God's love for us is not determined on how good we are or his acceptance of us. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'm not good enough. The Bible tells us in Romans 3.10, none is righteous, no, not one. Romans 3.23 tells us, for we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So no matter how much we do, we will never measure up to being good enough for God. Because his standard is perfection. Now we may be good enough for man in the world's standard, but again, we will never be good enough for, man, for God because God, our good is not good enough. Now, some of you here, you hear this and you think, well, then what am I supposed to do? How do I grab? How do I get God's attention? You know, how do I perform? If I don't perform, you know, I won't be good enough for him. On the other hand, some of you thinking, well, if I do a certain thing, if I act a certain way, if I strategically perform at a high level, do A, B, C, one through three, if I'm, good, if I'm a good enough girl or boy and score that touchdown or have this acclaim or, or, or have the corner office or make a certain amount of money or have certain followers, I'll be good enough. Then and only then will I be good enough. Have you felt that way before? Some of us Christians will do the same thing. 
in our Christian walk. You know, we'll get all spiritual with it. You know, God, you know, I'll read my Bible every day. You know, matter of fact, I'll read a chapter every day in my Bible. Because you know what, God, you know, you know what, God, you know, uh, a chapter a day helps keep the, the devil away. Like, God doesn't know that already. That's why he gives us a book. He says in James 4, 7, submit yourself to God. Resist the devil, devil and he will flee. He also tells us in Ephesians 6, 13, put on the full armor of God to resist and stand your ground on the evil day from the evil one. So God already knows this. So the more you get into his word, the more he equips you to defend the devil, to defend yourself from the devil. So God already knows that. Then you go, okay, I'll pray every day. I'll pray for five minutes. I'll pray for 10 minutes. Better yet, I'll pray for 30 minutes. You know, I'll really dig in my prayer. Um, you know, I'll, 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 just, I'll just speak in tongues all day, everywhere I go. You know, then I'll be good enough for God. I'll read. I'll be good enough. I'll, I'll, I'll pray. I'll be good enough. You know what, God? I'm going to show you I'm a good Christian. Because these are the things that I'm going to do every day. But no. God says, look, you know, all this before me you're doing, wow, Andre, you know, you, you're a good dude. You're praying every day. You, 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 you get into your Bible every day. You know, I gave you a message. You gave a message. It was, it was, it was phenomenal. You know, you performed. You did great. The people clapped. They were, you know, they were excited to hear the word. You gave my word good. You performed well enough. Now you're good enough for me. Is that what God says to us? No. Well, guess what? My good enough is still not good enough for God. I'll never get to that point and you will never get to that point in your life where we're good enough for God. It's all a performance trap. A performance game will never win. You know, it's like um, thinking it's all based on performance. We'll limp through our life thinking that God looks at everything that I'm doing, how I perform and how I'm the greatest at what I do. But God doesn't look at it that way. Now, don't get me wrong. Performing is not bad. You know, you perf almost awake is performing in front of uh, crowds of people. That's good. You know, you perform at your job, you know, meeting sales quota. That's good. That's great. You perform in your home or you're, you're doing well in your home with your kids and your family and your marriage. You, you know, that's great. You, you come to church on time. You know, you leave later than other folks. That's great. But that's still not good enough for God. So take the pressure off of you. You don't have to perform. I don't have to perform. We don't have to perform to get God's attention. Amen? There's nothing I can do or you can do right, good, or worthy to stop God from loving us, from accepting us right where we are today. Nothing. He doesn't love us any more. He doesn't love us any less. So I ask you, then what are you supposed to do? How can you be good enough for God or anyone else? Well, that's a good question, and I'll answer that for you. It is simply, God doesn't look at your performance. <clears throat> he looks at your heart. I'll say it again. God doesn't look at your performance. He looks at your heart. So where is your heart lining up with God's word? So the question isn't, am I or are you good enough? The question is, how does what you're doing line up with God's word? Where is your heart in that matter? Amen? So God is looking at those deep, hidden things, your inner thoughts and desires that your family know nothing about, that your friends know nothing about, that your pastors don't even know anything about. That's what God is looking at. What makes you tick? God is looking at more than just your behavior and your performance. He's looking at what you, why you do what you do. Why do you do what you do? Why do we do what we do? What's inside of us? What is plaguing us that needs to come out that's preventing us get from getting closer to God? What is it? That's what he wants to know. What's keeping you from me? Uh, I refer to uh, my don't miss worship message. In that message, I use the scripture, John 4, 23. It says where Jesus said, the father is looking for true worshipers who will worship him in spirit and truth. And I said to you, it doesn't matter how you worship. So if you're running and jumping, you're screaming, you're hollering, long as your heart and mind is in the right place, it's all acceptable to God. Again, it's a heart and a mind matter. So no matter how crazy you look from worshiping, no matter how crazy you may sound, 
none but love. Well, how I may sound up here, it's all a matter of my heart and your heart. Amen? So what's God's answer to the performance game we keep playing? It's justification. Justification, and I'll show you. Turn with me to Romans 5.1. NRSV is the new revised standard version. I think that's what it is, yeah. That's the version I'm reading from. Rome, are you there? Romans 5.1. Amen. It says, therefore, since we are justified by faith, it's like we haven't even sinned. We are justified by faith. It's a faith action. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So if you're trying to prove just how good you are through your performance, it's a trap. It's a trap, y'all. It's like being on a treadmill going nowhere. You know, them treadmills, them ellipticals, you never go anywhere like that. I'm doing all these miles and I ain't gone anywhere yet. You know how the elliptical is, right? <laughs> Sweating and working the arms and legs and you haven't gone anywhere. Amen. Stop being tread militant. Woo! Think about that. Stop being tread militant. All right? Get off the treadmill and say, God, I realize that I'm justified. I realize that I'm justified by my faith, my faith in you. That's justified. Amen? So you mean to tell me I've been free from guilt and sin? Yes, I have. You mean to tell me he's pardoned and acquitted us for all those who believe in him and trust in him and have faith in him? Yes, he has. Let's look at Hebrews 11.6. Very familiar scripture here. And remember, read all the scriptures that I'm giving you as if it's talking and speaking directly to you. Okay, apply this to you. So everywhere the eyes and yous is you. Amen? So Hebrews 11.6 says, Without faith, it's impossible to please God. For whoever will approach, comes near, Amplified Version says, comes near, get close to him, must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly and diligently seek him. So does this mean that all I have to do is have faith and believe in God to please him? No, that's part of it, but that's not the only thing that we have to do. Does this mean I can act up like a fool, lie, steal, and cheat, still leave, live like the devil, and still please God? No. You can't. You can't serve two masters here. So what the scripture is saying it's a, it, is that faith is a rate exchange between you and God. A rate exchange. The rate exchange is this. You have faith. You believe that he exists. You earnestly seek him. He pleased. He's pleased by that. He rewards you. That's the rate exchange. Amen? Does that make sense? Even though we're working on, even though you're working on your faith, you really don't seek him. You really don't really believe he exists because you're still trying to figure it out every day. He still loves us. He still, ex he still accepts us right where we are. Even though your life is crazy, you still tripping. You know, tripping, we used to say back in the day, and I guess they say cray-cray now, right? So either tripping back in the day or acting cray-cray today, he still loves us. He still loves us. Even if our performance is, is whack, we're not meeting the standards, even though our lives are wrecks, he still loves us. He's not pleased with the actions, but he still loves us. I mean, to think that that's like a parent, God is like our father. You know, you, no matter what your kid does, you know, I still love you. Regardless, no matter what you go left, you're right, I still love you. Amen. He still loves us. So let me explain. Religion would have you thinking that you need to do X, Y, and Z to please God. You got to do one, you got to do the other. You know, it's like you got to do certain things to please God. And he looks at you and says, okay, I accept you. Right? Now, I'm not advocating sin or saying you can't get away with certain things or, or you can act all kind of way is what I mean to say. Um, but if you keep sinning and you're constantly living that sin and not feeding your soul and your spirit with the word of God, eventually that sin is going to catch up to you. Now, 
I'm going to go to scripture here for, for a moment, but read this. Remember, read it as if it's speaking to you. It says in Romans 6, 23, for the wages which sin pays is death, but the bountiful free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to die today. As soon as I sin, I'm going to die. You know, eventually death is going to catch up to you. Not necessarily physical death, but death in areas like your marriage, death in areas like your finances, your job with your friends, your grades. Somewhere in your life, death is going to meet you. And you're going to wonder, why, what, what, what's happening here? Why is it, you know, I'm considering my ways, I'm praying, but I keep sinning. So you have to decide whether you, what you want to do and, 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 and how you're doing it. Amen? Turn with me to Colossians 1, 21, 22. Now, now be clear with me on the death piece. If you break down that scripture, the commentary doesn't say you're going to die, but it will affect you in certain areas of your life. So you have to be balanced and consider the things that you do you know, especially if you say you believe what you say you believe. Colossians 1, 21, 22. The New American Standard Bible. Whoa, all right. It says, although, and although you were formerly alienated, others translations say estranged, disconnected here, and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds. Number uh, 22, verse 22 says, yet he has now reconciled you, me, us, in his fleshly body through death in order to present us, you, me, I, before him, holy and blameless, beyond reproach. Amen. Meaning we were once alienated and estranged because we had no knowledge of him. We had no knowledge of his love, his grace, his nature, his attributes, his life. But through what Jesus did on the cross, he has reconciled us with our God. What Jesus did on the cross, recognize what he did on the cross. Whatever he did was nailed on the cross, ended there. Romans 5, 10 says, we were, one, we were once or we were enemies at one time. For if we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through death by his son. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? When Christ died on the cross, he just, he, he, he satisfied, excuse me, God's judgment. He made it possible for God's enemies, those who were once alienated, estranged, who didn't know him, to find peace with him. So when you hear the tapes rolling in your mind over and over again, I'm not good enough, I'm not good enough, I'm not good enough. Don't give in to the enemy. Amen? And if you keep continuously arguing with the enemy, you're going to say, you know what? You're right. I am not good enough. I'm not good enough for God. I'm not good enough for anybody else. I'm not even good enough for myself. But let me tell you something. Don't waste your time arguing with the enemy. Point him to God. Amen? Amen? Because when God, when God says, oh, yeah, that Andre that you told me was nothing, he's not good enough. You know, when I see Andre, I see Jesus. You know, when I see followers of Christ and those who are followers of Christ, I see Jesus. I see Jesus. I see Jesus. I see Jesus. He sees tremendous value in us. He sees the righteousness of Christ in us, something we didn't even deserve. I'll never be good enough, will never be good enough to merit what Jesus Christ did on the cross. Our goodness will always fall short, period. Remember, our good is not good enough, but our God is. He made up the difference by sending Jesus Christ to reconcile us to God through what he did on the cross, which was the most vulnerable act in history. He gave up his life for each and every one of us in this building. So you are special to him. Let's look at John, 1 John 1, 9. I'm going to read from the Amplified Version, so let, some, let me know when you're there, please. Anybody let me know. All right, thank you. <laughs> Praise you, Father. 
Thank you for your word. It says, if we freely admit that we have sinned and confess our sins, he is faithful and just, true to his own nature and promises, and will forgive our sins and continuously cleanse us from all unrighteousness, everything not in conformity to his will and purpose, thought and action. That's some good stuff, y'all. So no matter if you mess up, as soon as you leave church, you repent, he continuously forgives you. Now, it doesn't mean you can continue doing it, but he forgives you because you repented. You came with a penitent heart, contrite, contrite heart. God, I've, I've sinned. Help me. If we spend time focusing on how much God loves us, the price he paid for us to redeem us, then we'll see ourselves as God sees us and understand just how much we are truly worth to him and loved by him. Amen? Elder David said it last week or a couple weeks ago. He said, God is jealous for us. Now, I'm not going to sing that song. Okay, but y'all heard the song before. David, I think it's David Crowder, but he is jealous for us. And all he wants is a little bit of our time, a little attention. You know, when you're dating someone and they don't act right, you get a little jealous. You're saying, babe, dang, baby, all I needed was a little time, a little attention. That's what God's saying to us. He don't call us baby. You know, he calls us his children. But, you know, that's what God's saying. He just wants a little time with us. He loves us so much. He really does. I mean, we're truly blessed to be here alive and well with all the turmoil that is going on outside these walls. Amen. 1 Corinthians 6, 20 says, For we were bought with a price. He loved us so much that he shed his blood and bought us with a price. How many of you here would shed your blood for your neighbor sitting right next to you? For me? For your family? I was watching the CNN special about this biker club I don't remember the name, but these cats were serious and intrigued me because I'm a man that likes that type of fellowship. And they were bikers, you know, and some of the things they did weren't, you know, all the way cool. But one thing I was amazed at is the interviewer interviewing them said that, you know, would you take a bullet for someone? And they said, yeah, absolutely. I'll take a bullet. I'll give my life for my brother. And that's a biker show. That's a biker group. I'm not downgrading the biker club, but that's a biker club. But would you be willing to give your life for me, for your brother and sister in Christ, in the name of Jesus? I'm just saying. So that's some real love. Take a bullet, the guy said. And, and, and you have to, it's all relative. Biker gangs, guns and bullets, it's relative. Us, it's, it's like, you know, fighting verbally and physically, you know, no gang banging, you know. But the bottom line is, they were willing to take a bullet, bullet, shed their blood for their brother, in this case brothers, but we, are we willing to do that? And that's what God did, us, did for us. And that's how much he loves us. So I, I hope you got that point because I'm really trying to drive that home. He loves us. He really loves us. God knew us before we were born. Ephesians 1, 5, and 6 says, and I'm going to paraphrase here, it says that he pre predestined us for adoption as his children according to the purpose of will of his will because he ple it, is, it pleased him, excuse me, that we might be to the praise of his glory, glorious grace that he so freely bestowed on us in the one he loves, Jesus. God has a plan and had a plan before we were even created. Even before he created the universe, he had a plan for us. And I believe he has a plan for each and every one that's here for such a time as this, in this church, in this community, in this city, in this world. He has a plan and he wants us to fulfill it. So each and every one that is alive, like Pastor Denley said, if you're alive and you're still standing, you have a purpose. You have a purpose. So I submit to you today that we were already good enough for God. We were already good enough for God because of what he did on the cross. And we didn't even do anything. We didn't even deserve it. So, don't get it twisted, though. It's by faith and acceptance of what he did on the cross that makes us good enough for him. Turn with me to Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. You still here with me? 
It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of your own works, so that no man, no one may boast. So it's not at your works. It's not at your merit, your deeds, you being good enough. Because let's keep it real. No matter all the stuff we've done, no matter how good enough we are, we would never be able to surpass, we would never be able to make up all the sins we've committed. Period. Sins we're committing. We're the only religion that is not built or founded on a merit system. Think about it. Other religions out there urge you to reach out to God. Grasp a hold of what he is. Whereas Christianity is the only religion that God reaches down to man. An invite. You have a choice. They have other systems in place whereby you do something to appease God. Whereas Christianity, a personal relationship with God, you don't. You, do, you don't have to do anything. There's not a one, two, three step. There's a faith confession, but it's not what I have to do. It's not, it doesn't imply me lifting this up to be accepted by God and be performing. That's the difference. It's by faith in him, accepting what he did on the cross for us, that we are justified and made righteous. And that makes us good enough for him, nothing else, period. That's what you need to grab a hold of. Now, now, now we're told to not take his grace for granted. And although we're still justified, there's still some things that we need to do and have to do. Amen? So let's, we're going to go look in the Bible and see some things that pleases God in our everyday life. What can we do? All right? Yeah. Write this down. We please God with faith in him. We already read Faith is a prerequisite of pleasing God. In 11.6 it says, without faith it is impossible to please him. We have to have that faith, that faith in him, that confidence, that assurance that God will do exactly what he says he will do in his word for your life, for your marriage, for your, your job, for your relationships. You have to believe and have faith in just what he said, Period. You know, it's just like that is faith and assurance that kids have when they come home. They just know mommy and daddy, dinner going to be ready. You know, lunch going to be ready. My clothes going to be ready. You know, they'd be washed every week. They're going to be clean. I mean, that's some, that's some deep stuff. And, and we're not even talking about God yet. We're just talking about little kids having faith and assurance in their parents that their parents will have no choice to take care of them. I mean, that's the kind of faith and assurance that God wants from us. Second nature. First nature in some cases. Hebrews 11 one says, Now faith is the confidence in what we hope for and the assurance about what we do not see. Simply put, faith is trusting in something you cannot explicitly prove. You just know that you know that you know that you know that you know. You just know when you sit in this chair, wherever these chairs are, they're going to hold my body up. You just know that you know that it is designed to support whatever size you are. That faith, that insurance, that's what God wants from us. We please God with fear of God. Psalms 147, 11 says, The Lord delights in those who what? Fear him. Who put their hope in, in his unfailing love. Unfailing love. What did I say earlier? He loves us. This kind of fear, this reverential fear, which is the proper fear, reverential fear, benefits not only, it doesn't benefit God, it benefits us. This reverential fear shows us that we have an immense amount of deep respect for God. The proper fear that will motivate us from not sinning and doing the things we know we shouldn't be doing. Like what? Cheating on your wife, cheating on your taxes, lying, stealing, cheating, killing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The list goes on. Moses said to the people in Exodus 20, 20, for God has come to prove you so that the reverential fear of him, 
That's the kind of fear, reverential fear, revering our God we need to have. May be before you that you may not sin. I mean, this is the kind of fear that reminds us that God will hold us accountable to our actions. So no matter what we're doing, how we're doing it, God will hold each and every one of us, each and every one of us accountable to our actions. And again, it may not happen then, as the verse said earlier, death, not necessarily right now, but death in other areas of your life. So check out what you're doing. Stuff you may be doing behind closed doors you may not, you may not want to do. We please God by following his son. So we got what we got. Uh, the, the first one was faith in God, fear of God. And the third one, or my third bullet here, uh, is uh, following his son. Matthew 17, 5. Write that down. While he, has still, while he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them. And for, from the cloud, a voice said, this is my son, the beloved. With him I am pleased or well pleased. Listen to him. Peter and Jesus are just kicking it. They're just talking. And all of a sudden, they hear a loud boom, noise, voice from a cloud coming down saying, look, that is my beloved son. I am well pleased with him. Listen to him. Hear him. Hear what he says. He says, I, I always do what pleases the Father. So if, God is pleased with the, so if God is pleased with Jesus and Jesus pleases the Father, then it will stand that what we do will please God also by what Jesus tells us to do and what not to do. Would you agree? Would you agree? Amen. Like what? Do what exactly what Ephesians 5, 2, 1 Corinthians 13, 4, 8 says. Walk in love. That's difficult, but you got to walk in love. James 1, 22. Be doers of the word and not hearers only. Mark 12, 30, 31. Love God, love people. <laughs> Woo, that's it. I got some more, though. Ephesians 6, 1, Colossians 3, 20. Obey your parents. He never put an age on it. He said, obey your parents, the people that brought you in this world. 1 Corinthians 14, 40. Do things decently in order. <coughs> Romans 12, 18, Hebrews 12, 14. Do your best to keep peace with everyone. Do your best to keep peace with everyone. Well, it didn't say, you know, like them, then you keep your peace. Love them, then keep your peace. Keep your peace with everyone. Whether you like them or you don't, keep your peace with everyone because you are representing the Father. You're representing Jesus. That's how we please God. Another way to please God is to obey his word. Deuteronomy 10, 12 and 13. Write that down. It says, the Lord your God asks you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, to love him, to serve the Lord, give God or to serve your Lord God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. Keep the Lord's commandments, his statutes, which I am commanding you today for whose good? For your good, for my good, for our good. He doesn't command us to obey his commandments for his good. He commands us to obey them for our good. They weren't set up for him. They were set up for us. Being obedient to his commandments proves that what? We love him. We demonstrate our faithfulness to him. We glorify him to this world. And guess what? It opens up the door for blessings for us. Blessings in our life, in our family, in our marriage. Um, breathing, that's a blessing. Living, that's a blessing. Looking with our eyes, that's a blessing. I mean, we're halfway home. Praise you, Jesus. Amen. Psalms 128 one says, Blessed are all who fear the Lord, who walk in obedience to him. Blessed are all that fear him. Reverential fear. Say reverential fear. That's the kind of fear he wants us to have for him. So the more we obey, the more we become like him. The more we are blessed, the more enriched our lives become. We please God by doing his will. Now, let me give my disclaimer. As a pastor, as your brother in Christ, as a believer, I have to refer you to his word. Okay, because this is the only um, guide, resource out there that can best describe 
give you the will for your life. So you know what I'm going to say. You got to get into your word. This is where we learn his will. We read his will. We study his will. We meditate on his will. And we pray on his will for us. That's how we please him. That's how we do our, his will. So the next verse I'm going to read, again, read it as if it's speaking to you. Hebrews 13, 21. Let me know when you're there. Thank you, sir. So we're going to read it like it's reading, uh, like, it re- uh, like it's speaking directly to you. Strengthen and make me what I ought to be and equip me with everything good. Say everything good. That I may carry out his will while he himself works in me and accomplishes that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever and ever and ever. Amen. Me, I, every good thing, I may carry out his will. What he, his works he accomplishes in me. That's his will. This is what he, this, it, that's his will for our lives. His will for our, our life goes beyond just knowing what he wants. It's all about doing what he wants. He wants us to become spiritually mature in his word. We grow in his word by applying his word. By applying his word, we see the the fruits in our lives. Amen? He wants us to renew our minds, to not lie, steal, or cheat, to repent of our sins, to accept his son and what he did on the cross, to believe in him, his son, to do as his son does, to walk in love, to give thanks in all circumstances. To avoid sexual immorality. To love him, God, with all your heart, soul, and mind. To love your neighbor, your brother, your sister, the black man, the white man, the homosexual man. That's his will for our life. That's what pleases him. When we humbly walk in that knowledge of knowing who we are in Christ, we can boldly and confidently say to the enemy, when the enemy reminds us how good we are not, You can say, get behind me, Satan. I am good enough. I am good enough through Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.